time uh, to be on with us. Congratulations. Uh, I, I wonder, in a moment like this, how do you properly allow yourself to enjoy a moment while still, <laughs> while still focusing on what are going to be the most important games your team will be playing coming up here in the finals? Yeah, it's new for me, for sure. Um, you know, I, I've, I've wanted to be a part of this um, all of my career. And, and when you get into the league, uh, you think it's easy, especially when you, you are a part of an organization like the Spurs um, and you watch them go through deep runs and you're a part of it um, different times of your career at different times. Um, but to be a head coach in this position, it's hard to describe, Scott. I'm just grateful. Um, and I think I'm just getting old because I really enjoyed watching <laughs> our players enjoy the moment. Um, but I'm so blessed to to coach the guys that I coach, to work with the people I work with, uh, to have a job. Um, this kind of job is something that I don't take for granted. Monty, when I was talking with Jeff Van Gundy and Mark Jackson about you, it's my observation. I think you allow your guys to be your guys. Mark Jackson says they know you give a crap about them. And yet you still have to coach him. I wonder how have you found the sweet spot of being all of the things that a man wants to be, a mentor, a leader, and, and a taskmaster when you have to be. How, how, how has that balance been achieved? Well, I expressed um, from the time I got the job in Phoenix and, and every new player that comes to our program, um, the essence of my coaching is to serve. Um, as a believer in Christ, that, that's what I'm here for. And I tell them all the time, if I get on you, I'm not calling you out, I'm calling you up. Uh, you have potential, and I have to work my tail off to help you reach that potential. And I think guys have embraced that. Uh, they understand that if I'm direct or black and white with them, it's not to make them feel bad. I want them to get paid, I want them to win. I want their families to enjoy it. And um, it served us well. Morning, Grace Walk. How's everybody? So this morning, uh, I'm going to refer to uh, Monty Williams later on in my sermon. Uh, but this morning, I want to talk about God's law. You know, in Christianity, we've kind of flipped on that a little bit. We've kind of made, if, if you hear law, we think legalism, correct? So... Uh, but was God's law legalism, or was it man adding to God's law that made it legalism? So I want to explain that, because God's law is good, and I, uh, I want to take you through some scriptures. Now, I'm going to begin reading God's law. At the very end, <clears throat> with, just before the children of Israel went into the promised land, Moses in Deuteronomy, which is the retelling, it's the retelling of the law, he begins to tell them uh, uh, all the law again. He clarifies some things. And then uh, uh, they get ready to enter into the promised land. But I saw something, and I love Deuteronomy chapter 30 because of all the promises, all the blessing that are linked to it. But I saw something in it that I'd never seen before, and that's the title of this sermon. He tells them, when you have fallen, when, when I have brought judgment and scattered you to other nations, if you will just return to me 
I will bless your life. So if you mess up and, and, and right from the beginning, God's word is he wants you to be blessed. Now, there are consequences when we do, have, do bad actions. I don't care who you are. But if we return to God with our, with our heart and keep his commandments, we get to choose to be under a blessing. So let me read that. Now, I've given you a choice between a blessing and a curse. When all these things have happened to you and you are living among the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you, you will remember the choice I gave you. If you and your descendants will turn back to the Lord with all your heart, obey his commandments that I am giving you today, then the Lord your God will have mercy on you. He will bring you back from the nations where he scattered you, and he will make you prosper again. Isn't that good? Even if you are scattered to the farthest corners of the earth, the Lord your God will gather you together and bring you back so that you may again take possession of the land where your ancestors once lived, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors were ever. If you just return to God, he wants to bless your life. He wants to favor your life, but you get to make that choice. If you didn't have that choice to accept or reject God, I mean, if I would love God just to zap me so I would never sin again. But you need that choice because in having choice, you can show God you love him. You can show God you don't love him by your choice. And, 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 and when you mess up, you can see how God loves you because he'll redeem you if you return back to him. These promises of blessings are for those who have screwed up. Now, I know in this in the first service, none of you have ever screwed up. So I'm only referring to the people that will be attending second service. None of you have committed a sin. None of you have known in your heart that God doesn't want me to do it, and you did it anyhow. The conditions for restoration and blessing was to turn back to God. And God's grace is available now as it was back then for anybody who returns to him. The law, now if I said commandment, you'd be okay. But law and commandment are the same word. Law, commandment, scriptures, they're all the same. The law... <clears throat> in the law of God, it shows he's a loving and redemptive God. So I just read the law, and the law says, if you screw up, you mess up your life, if you return to me, I will bless you and prosper you. If the law's legalism, does that make God legalistic? I mean, he created the law. Think this through. I think it's disrespectful when we say God's law is legalism. Remember, what we call legalism sometimes is when the Jewish people would add to the law of God. They would add their rules and regulations. Now, they did this in a, with a good heart. Many of them, they call this building fences around the word of God. So <clears throat> they would make a law here and a law here so I can get up to here. But Jesus got so frustrated with him, he says, your traditions, your laws that you've in place have made God's word none and void. It's not that the law was wrong. It was the people who added to the law. You know we're not supposed to add to the word of God. But neither are we to take away from the word of God. So we can be guilty and slide one way or the other, but if we return back to what God says, God's favor and blessing is going to be on our life. Now, Jesus is our example, right? We're to live and be like Jesus. Jesus kept the law. 
How do I know that? The Bible says he was sinless. So if he had sinned, he wouldn't have been sinless. How about John the Baptist? I've heard people say, well, you can't keep the law. It's impossible to keep the law. But yet here we see John the Baptist's parents kept the law. During the time when Herod was king of Judah, there was a priest named Zacharias who belonged to the priestly order of Abai. And his wife's name was Elizabeth, and she also belonged to a priestly family. They both lived good lives in God's sight and obeyed fully all the Lord's laws and commandments. I would say they reached their potential. Now, did they die without breaking the law? Probably not. <laughs> but who knows? All we know is what the Scripture says. A better question I want to ask you today, and I want you to ponder this question, is what does the law teach? The law teaches that what God defines as sin, bad behavior, or lawlessness. You know, that word lawlessness, as you read the New Testament, you're going to find that pop that you're going to find that Jesus says the lawless won't enter into the kingdom of God. You're going to find that the devil is called the lawless one. Who wants to be like the devil? Good. No hands this service. <clears throat> I was a little sketchy on asking that one. But the law defines what, what we know is godly or ungodly. I know what God wants because I can read his commandments and his commandments tell me what is right or wrong. It also teaches God's name. So I know God is a provider because in the law it says he's Jehovah Jireh. I know God's a healer because in the law it says he is Jehovah Rophi. Amen? So the law is good. The law's not bad. What's bad is when we add to the law and put our rules and regulations on top of the law or we subtract from the law because we want to live a certain way. So then, uh, then oh yeah, well, I don't like that commandment. The law also gives you common sense, practical, how to solve things. How to handle disputes, what to do in a dispute. The law teaches us that if somebody accuses somebody of something, they have to have witnesses. I mean, these are pretty good things, right? It teaches us what's ethical, moral, and just. We know what God's standards are because of the law. Now, in Judaism, they had the law of God, then they had the oral law. How many know what the oral law is? A few of you will know what that is. But the oral law is what they felt God had kind of left out and they filled in the gaps with. And they passed that from generation to generation. And from that, they developed other laws from it. Now, some of those are great traditions they've developed and deep insights into the Word of God. But some of it, it just can be nonsense. And this is why Jesus rebuked the Pharisees when they said, hey, your disciples, uh, they're out picking grain, and, and they didn't wash. The law says we're to wash our hands. And, and he says, no, it doesn't. See, <clears throat> the law, we can make extremely complicated also. Now, there's things in the law that I don't fully understand. But I do know this, that God is a good God. And why would he uh, 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 make, did he mess up? Did he screw up creating the law? No. No, the law is good for us, as you're going to see. So the son's coach, Monty Williams, made this statement in that video. He was a man of faith, and he didn't call his players out. He called them up, up to their potential. See, God wants to call you and I up to our potential. 
We are in a generation that hands out trophies whether you win or lose. I'm going to tell you, God has some standards. And we need to learn to live in his standards, not our standards, not what we decide is right and wrong. How many brought an idol uh, to church this morning? Just raise your hands. An idol. None of you are idol worshipers? Well, what is an idol? It's a belief system that you place in an object. And you might, you might agree with that belief system. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's a person. And maybe that person says, hey, you know what? You don't got to get married. You can live together and make heaven your home. That's your idol. So when you read in the Word of God, and the Word of God says, no, you need to repent of that. You need to get married. What do you do? I got this idol. You mix God's Word with what you want. Does that make sense? So we got to get rid of our idols. The number one find in Israel were pocket-sized idols from the Jewish people. And we're just as bad. Being a Christian doesn't mean I don't sin. But that I'm aware of my sin because of the commandments, because of the law, and I sin less. I can feel, it's good to feel convicted once in a while. It's good to feel, you know, uh, 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 not right. It's good to know because that's God dealing with you so you can grow, so you can go up to your potential. The law, commandments, Torah, scriptures, they're pretty much interchangeable. So in the New Testament, when it says they are reading and studying the scriptures, you think they're reading and studying Paul's letters? No. Because they weren't called scriptures. Not We didn't make them the New Testament as part of the Old Testament for a couple hundred years after all those letters had been written. So scriptures in the Bible is when what they're studying. They're, you know, Paul's addressing a, a, a Jewish audience a, a, a lot of the times, and then he'll address a, a, a non-Jewish uh, uh, audience, like uh, it calls them Gentiles in, in the Bible. People that weren't born Jews or had become Jews. So there's times he reflects one way or another way to capture his audience. So pretty much after you've been saved a while, you've heard this illustration of what sin is. Okay, it's an archery turn. <clears throat> When you miss the target, the person would say, sin. Now let me ask you, what is the target? See, if you don't know what you're shooting for, if you don't know what the target is, if you don't know what you're aiming for, how are you going to hit it? See, the target was what is called the Torah or the commandments or the law. It's how to walk righteously with God. So, when we sin, we miss God. So I don't think God is the problem. Man was the problem. God's law is not the problem. As a believer, God will write his commandments on your heart. Now look at this prophecy in Jeremiah. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it in their hearts I will be their God, and they will be my people. Then in Hebrews, it says, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After these days, says the Lord, I will place my laws in their hearts and write them in their minds. When I got saved, a number of things I did, I thought, in my mind, my laws, my own personal laws, well, that wasn't sin. That was just having a good time. So, so my laws were different than the Word of God's laws. But in time, God would deal with me on the inside. God doesn't just poof, change us overnight. He begins to change us on the inside out. He wants, he, his Word begins, that's why you feel conviction. You say, man, I know I shouldn't have done that. 
God wants to help you. He wants to transform your life. He wants to renew your mind. He wants to renew what you call right and wrong and clarify that. I always, when I talk about God's law, I always bring up Titus because Titus is a very important scripture because we have made in Christianity the law versus grace, and they can't work together. They, but I'm going to tell you they work perfectly together. But let's read about grace. The grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all people. It educates, it teaches, it instructs us so that we can live sensible, ethical. We know what's right and wrong. And godly life's right when? After we get to heaven? Right now. By rejecting ungodly lives and the desires of this world. Yeah, look, man, your flesh, your, your, your sinful nature doesn't want to stop sinning. And when you get saved, you're going to have this battle. You're going to have one master and another master battling for control. But grace gives you power to overcome and change and grow. At the same time, we wait for the blessed hope and the glorious appearance of our great God, and Savior Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us in order to rescue us from every kind of lawless behavior and cleanse us a special people for him who are eager to do good actions. Then he says, what, what are we to do? We're to talk about this, right? We're, we're, we're to talk about these saints. We're to encourage one another we're to correct with complete authority and don't let anybody disrespect you. So, I'd like to say, when I got saved, I just had it together. But we all know Pastor Joe didn't have it together. You come and hear his testimony. He was raised on a ranch and he became a hippie. I mean, that in itself is sin. I don't know where that's in the law, but I'm sure it's there if I searched. <laughs> and so when Joe, my, my, Pastor Joe, he's my brother, so sometimes I don't mean to be disrespectful, but when he would, he got saved in jail. And he's going to tell me about Jesus? <laughs> I've got it together. People like me. I was a hit at the parties. I was so much better than him. I remember he got on the radio. Oh, my God. His church put him on the radio to give his testimony. I was so cringing. Oh, my God, are my friends hearing this? See, I was self-righteous. It wasn't until I'd given my life and he led me to the Lord and I felt the presence of God and I began to come to church, I realized how deep a sinner I was. So, the, so, so God begins to work on us from the inside out. Jesus died to help us overcome lawless behavior. That's breaking the commandments of God. The law is not a means of salvation because only trust and faith can bring us to a relationship with God. The law was never designed to get you to heaven by keeping the law. Everybody had to trust and, and, and believe God. Let, even when the law was first given out, let, let's go back to Passover. Let's go back when the children of Israel were in Egypt. They're in Egypt. They are in bondage. They are in captivity. And God begins to bring plagues. Right? 
on the tenth plague, that is the plague of where God is going to send a death angel among the people, and every firstborn, whether they're Jewish or Egyptians, is going to die unless they go get a lamb, they sacrifice a lamb, and they put the blood on their door. And when the F angel saw that, he passed over their home. They did not earn their salvation. They did not get their lives together for that. God loved them. He had made a covenant with them, and he went and rescued them from their bondage, just like he wants to rescue you. The law wasn't given until <clears throat> they had got free and set it away. Then God gave Moses the law and the commandment. But was the law ever there before? Did people know God and what righteousness was before the law was ever written? Well, we know, we know Joseph did. Hundreds and hundreds a year before there's a written law, he makes a statement, I can't sleep with my boss's wife. That would be sin to God. She was trying to seduce him to sleep with him, but he knew right and wrong. See, when you get saved, when you walk with God, God begins, you begin to know what's right and wrong. God places that in your life. God's law blesses us when we obey it and curses it when we disobey it, and it defines sin for us. That's the work, that's what the law, it's not to get us saved, we still have to come in relationship <clears throat> with Jesus. We still have to give our lives and accept him. Amen? But the law does point us to Jesus. That's one of its missions. Now, one of the first scriptures I learned, because I did not believe I was, I did not believe the law was good. I didn't, you know, uh, Christ was the end of the law, Romans 10.4. Uh, so that was one of the first. So I thought, well, it's all over. I'm okay. But as I learned and I grew, I understood the word in when it was translated in King James's day time period meant something very different than our day and time period. Our day means stop. It's over, right? But back then, it meant like the end of a spear, pointing. A better translation is go. So the goal of the law was to point us that we need a Savior, that we are messed up and we need a Savior. You're not okay. You need Jesus. So is the law flawed then? Be careful how we reverence what God has spoken. Remember, the law is God's spoken word. Be careful if you call the law legalism or it's flawed. <clears throat> I want to read to you uh, Psalms 19. Now, we quote the last verse of Psalms 19 at the end of every service. But I want to read from verse 7 down. The law of the Lord is perfect. How many heard that? It gives strength. The commandments of the Lord are trustworthy giving wisdom to those who lack it. The laws of the Lord are right, and those who obey them are happy. You want to be happy? Live for God. Live for God. The commandments of the Lord are just. They give understanding to the mind. They make sense of the world. Reverence for the Lord is good. It will continue forever. The judgments of the Lord are just. They are always fair. They are more desirable than the finest gold. They are sweeter than the purest honey. They give knowledge to me, your servant. I am rewarded for obeying them. None of us can see our own heirs. This is David writing. Deliver me, Lord, from my hidden faults. You know, God's word begins to, 
it, it just begins to stir things up in our life. Keep me safe from my willful sins. Now, what's another word for willful sins in the Bible? Iniquity. It's when you know to do right, but you do wrong anyhow. So here David is saying, keep me safe also from my willful sins. Don't let them rule over me. Then I shall be perfect and free from the evil of sin. David says the law is good, but he needs help with his willful sins. Now, do not raise your hands, but I need help from my willful sins. I need God to help me at times in my life not give in to my old nature. And it's important to see God's heart. His love for us is when you sin, he says, what? Return. That's God's heart. He didn't create you to destroy you. That's not his mission. He created people to have a relationship with him. He wants to have a relationship with you. But you know and I know you can't have a relationship with someone if you're always lying to them, if you're always, if you're always sinning against them, if you're always uh, hurting them. It's hard to have a relationship. But you want to you wanna show God you love him? John said keep, keep his commandments. That's how we can show God that we love him. So grace doesn't lower the bar. Grace raises the bar, calls us up to our potential. Remember, Jesus died to set us free from lawless behavior. We were eager to do good deeds. What, what, what the church did, what Pastor Joe did and the other staff members did the other day was a good deed. They went with the police department. They prayed over an area. They took time. Does that make sense? Jesus didn't rescue us from sin so we could live a lawless life or a sinful life. I know that's a popular teaching right now, but I want you to reason with me about that. I want you to think that through. Don't make that an idol in your life. God wants you set free. Sin binds us. Sin destroys us. Sin ruins your marriage. Sin ruins your children. Sin ruins your, your job. Sin... sin unravels you it makes you someone you don't want to be Romans 8 says so now there isn't any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus the law of the spirit of life there are different laws this is the law of the spirit of life there's the law <clears throat> of Christ there's a the law of sin <clears throat> there's man's law. So, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, let, let me break that down. Grace is receiving forgiveness for breaking God's law or his commandments. Breaking the law of God or breaking the commandments of God is sin. And sin leads to death. So Jesus, <clears throat> there's no condemnation because God is set, setting us free from that bondage. Thus, being under grace means we are free from bondage of the law of sin and death. We now have power to keep God's law through the Spirit. The Spirit brings life. So we can change. You can't, you might, you say, I know, Pastor, you don't know. You don't know how many times I, I have fallen. I have, I, 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 I go back to this sin. I, 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 you don't know how many times I've struggled. I'm going to tell you, God's not done with you. That's why you're listening. That's why you're here. God's not done. He, this message is for you. He wants you to know he's not finished with you yet. He's still working on you. And as long as you return, there's hope, there's change, and you will have victory at some point in your life. Listen to this prophecy from Ezekiel. I will give you a new heart and a new mind. 
I will take away your stubborn heart of stone and give you an obedient heart. I will put my spirit in you and you will see to it that you follow my laws and keep all the commandments I have given you. Then we pick this up in Romans 12 too. Do not conform yourself to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to him and is perfect. I'm going to tell you, God can change our lives. I am not the same sinner when I first got saved. Have I stumbled? Have I fallen? Yes. Have I, have I will, did willful sins? Yes. But as long as I returned to God, God would heal. He'd bring grace. He, he would help me. He'd help me overcome. And he's changing me step by step. But could I leave God right now? Absolutely. Could I give in to my sin nature? Absolutely. But I choose to be blessed. I don't choose to have a curse on my life. I choose to be blessed. I don't want God to scatter me. I, I don't want God to, 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 to correct me. I want God to favor me. I want whatever I put my hand to, whatever I put my hand to, that God bless. That's the law. Now, when you read Romans chapter 7, and you, it took me years and years and years to understand and break this out because <clears throat> I just didn't know. But this is what the traditional thinking I got is there's freedom from the law. But what does that mean? If the law is good, if God created, what does that mean? So <clears throat> Romans 7, it says, he starts out and he says, brothers and sisters, I'm talking to you as people who know the law. So he's talking to the Jew. He has a Jewish audience right now. He's talking to the Jewish people. Don't you know the law has power over someone only as long as he or she lives? A married woman is united with her husband under the law while she is alive. But if her husband dies... She is released from the law concerning her husband. So then if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, she's committing adultery. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law and she won't be committing adultery if she marries someone else. Okay? Now, is God, is Paul writing here saying that the law is over. The law is done. Is that, is that what? That's what most people translate that as. And as they go through Romans 7. She is still responsible to keep the rest of the law. She's just not under that law anymore because her husband died. So she wouldn't be keep, make, committing adultery. But she's not allowed to go kill her new husband because he won't take out the trash. She can't murder him because he's a bum and he doesn't support her. It, it didn't remove all the laws. It was the whole law explained. That's what the whole law said. See, Paul's point is that since we have died with Jesus, the penalty of law, which is is death that we fully deserve for our sins no longer applies for us. Amen? Isn't that good news? Because you deserve the, the penalty. The law didn't change <clears throat> our status quo or her status quo. What changed was who were bound to in marriage. What changed in her life was now she wasn't bound to that to her husband, she was free to go on. Not to commit other sins. We have died to sin, and Paul's illustration is that sin, stay with me, sin was our spouse. But we are free from that, <clears throat> but not all of the law. 
Let me go on a little farther. That is how it is with you, my friends, as far as the law. Now, I put <clears throat> the, the in italics because I want to teach you something that took me a long time to understand. Whenever it says the law, it's talking about the Torah or the commandments of God. <clears throat> That's what it's talking about. But sometimes in the English translations, we add the before law regardless. And that's what is what done there. It's not in the Greek here. <clears throat> it only says law. That is how it is with you, my friends, as far as law is concerned. You also have died because you are part of the body of Christ, and now you belong to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might be useful in the service of God. So, law without the the in front of it means man's law. Remember, I told you there are different laws. And so you, it, it, I, I mean, I never knew that until I, in study, and, and, and some scholars like Joseph Schulman, uh, David Stern, uh, Tom Bradford, they point this out, but me, I, I would have never saw it. So I'm pointing it out to you because law sometimes, God, Paul is not referring to God's law. He's referring to man's law And until you see that. See, <clears throat> man-made rulings or their doctrines or law. Remember, I told you earlier, Jesus referred to them as traditions of men. A good example of that would be Bible colleges. Is there any Bible college that does not teach the Word of God? No, they all teach the Word of God. But they teach the Word of God through their doctrine. So if I'm a Baptist and I go to Bible college, they're going to teach me Calvinism. That's what they will teach me. They will teach the Word of God, but they will teach me their doctrine of Calvinism. If I am, uh, uh, go to Assembly of God, they're going to teach me not Calvinism, but maybe more free will, and they're going to sprinkle in there the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues, that is their doctrine. So that's, if you're a student, you're going to go, you're going to hear. If I were to go to Church of Christ Bible College, they're going to teach me the Word of God. All these churches you're going to get saved in and make heaven your home, even though they disagree on these different things. But if I were to go to the Church of Christ, they're going to teach me there are certain instruments that cannot be up on this stage and used. That's their doctrine. That's how they run their organization. That's what their scholars have said is right. I just want to know what the Bible says is right. But it's hard to get. It's hard not to get doctrine. It's hard not. And we have to separate. To learn, we have to say, okay, the Baptists say this. The Assembly of God say this. And you have to pray about it. You have to seek God. Okay? It's not that, it's not that they're, both of those places are going to take you to heaven. Amen? But they're also going to add in their man-made doctrine. The, in Romans chapter 7, and <clears throat> it says, So the law itself is holy, and the commandments is holy, righteous, and good. The law, the commandments, the Torah, Moses' law, it's, is holy. The commandments is holy and righteous and good. Now, I want to use this illustration. I want to close here. Some of you <clears throat> might be carrying a terminal il illness and not know it. You might not be feeling quite right. You're, you're just, you know, you're, uh, so you go see your doctor, or maybe it's your yearly physical. You go to your doctor, and they do some blood tests, and the doctor comes up. Thank you, Marcus. The doctor comes up, and he says, uh, I'm sorry, Fred, but <clears throat> you have 
cancer. You, you have an incurable disease. There's nothing. There is nothing I can do for you. The doctor is the law. The law shows us that we're sinful. So if I'm out witnessing to one of my friends or someone else, uh, they might think, I thought I was a good person. I thought I was going to heaven. I didn't think he was going to heaven. But I really didn't care. But in my own heart, I thought I was good. But Pastor Joe pointed out to me, and he showed me that I was not right before God. And because he did that to me, not once, but for about two and a half years, he kept planting the Word of God in me, he kept planting the Word of God in me. All of a sudden, I prayed a sinner's prayer with him and got right with God. But I had to hear, I had to hear what was right and wrong. I had to know, you know, he wouldn't have used the word back there or lie. He would have said commandments or whatever. I had to know what was right with God because in my mind, I was a good person. So when we witness to somebody, we're presenting God's commandments to them <clears throat> to help them find God. Amen? So the law simply points us to that we need a relation, that we need a Savior, that if we fall, that we need a Savior to pick us up and to bring healing back in our life. Amen? If you're walking in the, in the light, you're keeping God's commandments. Now, <clears throat> while heads are bowed and eyes are closed in here, no one's looking around. This morning, maybe something I said in the sermon, it, it deeply affected you and, and, and you felt convicted. Maybe you even got mad at me. But I'm going to tell you, God wants to bring healing to your life. And that healing comes as he takes that sin out of your life. But you can't earn your way. You can't get your life together and come to God. you got to come as you are right now. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one's looking around here, If you know that you are not right with God, if maybe you're watching online, you're listening uh, to this, but you know there's sin in your life and God is convicting you of that, why don't you just simply repent of that right now? So if you'd like to give your life to Jesus Christ right now, I just want you to raise your hand up right now. Amen. 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 Many hands going up. Amen. Amen. Maybe, maybe you, 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 you had a relationship with God. You love God. But I want to go back. Deuteronomy says, return to me if, if, if your life. And that's why you're here this morning. That's why you're watching online. God wants to heal you. He, he's not here to punish you. He wants to heal you. Raise your hand up right now. Amen. Amen. Now, you can put your hands down. I'm going to ask everybody in this congregation, if you're watching online, I want you to pray this prayer out loud because <clears throat> you're going to surrender your life and make Jesus your Savior. So right now, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, say these words. Jesus, today, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, and I give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, <clears throat> I'm going to have you stand to your feet. I'm going to pray a blessing on your life. Now, remember, I read Psalms 19. This is the last verse in Psalms 19. Don't forget to mail your letters. Say these words. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock 
and my Redeemer. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a wonderful Sunday.